Hi, I'm Quinn and I'm autistic. Welcome to Autistomatic. No. Me. Law. A. Nein. Ochi. No. Wherever you come from, whatever language you speak, no is one of the most powerful words we'll ever learn. For marginalised people in our communities, it can be one of the most important too. That short, unambiguous word is sometimes the only thing that stands between us and misrepresentation, exploitation and even punishment. Yet despite its lack of ambiguity, it's a word that's misunderstood, ignored or put into our mouths more perhaps than any other. Today, I want to talk about something that's been a hot-button topic in autism-related academia for some time. Something which has that punchy little word right at its centre. Pathological demand avoidance. Some of the exchanges between academics on the subject have been colourful, shall we say. There seems to be a tacit acceptance of PDA's existence, but where to place it? Some are adamant that it's a trait specific to autistic people and even suggestions it should be part of the diagnostic criteria. So, what does it mean? Demand avoidance isn't a difficult phrase to digest. It describes a behaviour. When a demand is made of someone who is demand avoidant, they're observed to avoid it. Whether we outright refuse, prevaricate, ask questions or simply don't do what's been asked of us, it fits into the demand avoidance criteria. Now, the possibility that someone might refuse or not follow through on demands is something we have to be aware of with everyone, autistic or not. And I'm quite happy to accept that it might be more common amongst autistic people than in neurotypical folks. It's the first part of the phrase that sticks in so many autistic crawls. When we describe a behaviour as pathological, we're suggesting it's a compulsive or obsessive need to act in a specific manner. It's a biological or psychological need about which we have little or no choice. An addiction of sorts. In the case of PDA, it's an addiction to saying no. We all know the stereotype of the pathological liar who lies by reflex, even when those lies contradict each other or harm them personally. And the pathological thief who steals things they neither want nor need, because they feel a need to steal. So, if our avoidance of demands is pathological, then it's because there's a disease or fault in our psychological makeup forcing us to do so. The PDA concept fits in quite nicely with the autism stereotypes of old. We've long been painted as antisocial loners who can't appreciate the feelings and needs of others, so when we appear unwilling to follow instruction, it's effortless to bundle it together as another symptom or expression of our dysfunctional autistic nature. The term demand in this context is quite flexible too. When I hear the word demand, I'm more likely to think of orders barked out by a cigar-chomping sergeant or a threatening letter from a creditor than I am a polite request. But in the context of PDA, a demand can be any instruction delivered in any manner. Whether the request is made in a friendly way, matter-of-factly, or aggressively, it's still a demand. And whether we say that demand exceeded someone's tolerance or make allowances for circumstance, the expected response from someone who's pathologically demand avoidant is no. Well, today I'd like to say no. No to the current narrative around pathological demand avoidance and the dangerous road it leads us down. Now, before I go any further, I'm not saying that PDA doesn't exist. We share this planet with 8 billion other people. So if nothing else, the balance of probabilities amongst the incredible variety of thought and expression in humanity 
mean it's completely feasible that people exist who genuinely feel a compelling need to refuse any request or demand made of them, and some of them will be autistic. What I am saying, though, is that much of what has been described as pathological demand avoidance in the past is often nothing of the sort, and I'd like to explain why. A person who either refuses or fails to carry out everything they're asked or told to do can be very frustrating to those around them, but it can also be very limiting to the individual at the centre of the situation too. Someone who is genuinely pathologically driven to refuse or avoid demands is unlikely to hold down paid employment or run a business. It would complicate their interactions with just about everyone they meet and make life almost impossible to lead independently. But there are millions of autistic people, diagnosed, self-identified and those still in the dark, who do lead independent lives though. We have jobs, families, social structures and responsibilities, and we manage, to the best of our ability, to function in an often hostile world. Yet now, some of us are finding ourselves encountering talk of PDA in the workplace or in education. That's a danger to all of us. The first time I came across such a story, it chilled me to the bone. But as more started crossing my path and having spoken to a number of people who've encountered difficulties thanks to such talk, I realised that we're facing a new threat in the public perception of autistic people. It's yet another medicalised description of autistic thought and motivation that's been entirely constructed from the views and feelings of people who find neurodivergent differences inconvenient and it's already causing mischief in the real world. As if we didn't already have enough damaging, out-of-date theories and stereotypes to battle with, now we have to add an irrational need to refuse requests into the mix too. Now, because I'm autistic, and most of the people I've spoken to on this subject are as well, I'm going to use language that reflects that. But everything we'll be discussing can apply to anyone who is or is perceived to be demand-avoidant whatever their neurodivergence, or even if they're neurotypical. Sometimes, what is seen as PDA is simply a communication problem. This is something I've had plenty of personal experience of myself. A demand or request is made, but my response is at odds with what the person making the demand expects or wants. Just like the double empathy problem, the person making the demand doesn't understand any response that doesn't match with their expectations, causing dissonance. Often the request that's made isn't clear to me, so I'll ask questions to clarify. I've been at the wrong end of so many misunderstandings in my past, I'm wary of following an instruction until I'm certain of what's expected of me. So instead of leaping into action, I probe further. Even though we're speaking the same verbal language, the meaning of our words in their context don't always get across. What may seem obvious to me may not be so clear to a non-autistic person, and vice versa. They may think their request is unambiguous and requires no clarification, but to me it's unclear, incomplete or even self-defeating. So I ask for more information. I'm not refusing to cooperate or even prevaricating. I'm missing information either about what you want me to do, how you want me to do it, or what the end goal we are aiming for is. So I ask questions until I'm happy that I understand. But I rarely get all the answers I need before people lose their patience. Trooper, the kitchen on this rebel vessel displeases me. Sort it out. Sir, could you be more specific? I'm not sure what you want me to do. I mean, there's a lot needs doing. Where do you want me to start? You are part of the Domestic Alliance and a caterer. Well, if you just tell me what you want me to do first. I will not repeat myself, Trooper. Sort out that kitchen or you will feel the true power of the dark side. And no disintegrations. Is that demand avoidance? I don't think so but I've been repeatedly told that it is. I understand that to neurotypical minds, the request may be as obvious as the speaker thinks it is, but it might not be for me. Treating my questions as hostility or unwillingness doesn't answer them 
and certainly won't increase my confidence in trying to carry out your instructions. If your request is ambiguous to me, I will always ask for clarity in the hope of matching your expectations. If you dismiss it as an attempt to get out of the task, you miss the whole point of the question. I want you to be happy with what I do for you, but I need more information to do that. If you don't answer me or get annoyed, then I'll stay in the dark and I will make mistakes. Why is there no clean cup for my afternoon tea? Why have the dishes not been washed? I'm sorry, sir. I didn't realise you wanted that done first. I find your lack of cooperation disturbing. I ordered you to sort the kitchen out. But I have been. I emptied out the garbage, scrubbed the cooker and cleared out the cupboards. I've thrown out all the expired tins and arranged the rest in date order. Enough. I've... Tidying does not concern me, Trooper. I want a cup of tea, not excuses. But, sir, I... You have failed me for the last time. <laughs> when I've miscalculated, like Trooper Gary there, I'm usually told that I'm being silly, childish, deliberately misunderstanding, being contrarian or lazy. Nobody cares that I may have expended far more effort reorganising everything than I would have just washing a few dishes. All that is seen is my lack of compliance with the instruction. There's numerous circumstances where communication differences might lead people to believe we may be avoiding an instruction when we're doing nothing of the sort. It's very common for us to need clarity, and plenty of situations arise where we might misunderstand. But communication can also be a problem in situations where we are avoiding a demand too. What if we're asked to do something which sets our senses on fire? Or something morally unjustified? Sometimes we're asked to do things which have consequences the speaker hasn't considered, or they're impractical, even sometimes just nonsensical. Sorry, sir. Something got caught in my throat. Do you want me to wash the dishes now, then? Yes. After you have put everything back as it was before. But that would mean putting the garbage back in the bins and making the cupboards untidy again. Don't be too proud of this organizational terror you've constructed. The ability to tidy a kitchen is insignificant next to my need for refreshment. I'm to wash the dishes so you have a clean cup and then mess up the kitchen. That doesn't make sense, sir. I'm altering the deal. Pray I don't alter it any further. Being unwilling to do something because the person issuing the instruction hasn't thought it through is far from pathological. It's rational demand avoidance. We might try to argue the point in the hope people will see sense, but all too often, we fail. Our neurodivergent brains don't necessarily see the same benefits as you do, and will often see connections that neurotypical people don't. When we voice our concern, you might take it as a signal of refusal or that we doubt your intentions, and if you weren't dealing with an autist, you may be right. But our comments and questions reflect a rational and thoughtful consideration we feel should be taken into account, and ignoring those concerns won't make them any less important. Of course, those same differences in communication and mental processing might mean it's us who are missing something. We might be worrying about nothing, oversensitive to some part of the request or just unaware of information that might shift our perspective. Whichever the case, all it takes is a little constructive dialogue to agree a mutually acceptable way forward. Of course, the communication issues become even deeper when we consider those of us who are non-speaking, whether ongoing or situational. Even if we have alternative communication methods available to us, we may find it difficult to convey our feelings, our reservations and our concerns. And what about those of us who simply get tongue-tied when trying to advocate for ourselves? Communication is a two-way street, and neither side should give up just because it's slow, difficult or confusing. 
It takes effort from both sides to have a prosperous exchange. And that means that the party making the request has a duty to ensure their demand is clear and worthwhile, however long it takes. Beyond miscommunication, though, there are many reasons why we may be genuinely reluctant or unable to do what we've been asked that won't be immediately obvious, even to other autists. It's rare you'll find an autist of any age who hasn't experienced a degree of unavoidable trauma in their lives, and the older we get, especially if we've remained unidentified, that trauma deepens as the same mistakes get repeated over and over again. There's a long list of reasons why we may hesitate or have difficulty cooperating. Stacked demands, or a list of instructions, may be problematic, even when they're written down. Do we do the tasks in the order they're given, or is there an unspoken priority? Will we get into trouble for picking the hardest one first so we take a long time to get round to the other jobs, or do the easiest task first and risk being called lazy? Just trying to work it out is a mental minefield where a single wrong step could spell disaster. Rejection sensitivity might lead someone to be demand avoidant. Their anxiety at being told their efforts aren't up to snuff can be enough to freeze someone who's rejection sensitive in their tracks as they hurriedly try to work out which will be the least traumatic course of action. If they don't comply, they'll likely suffer some form of consequence. But will it be worse than being balled out for doing the task badly? PTSD is far more common in autistic people than most people realise, and it can also have a huge impact on how we react to certain requests, maybe even all requests. And of course there's executive function to consider. Most autists will, at least at some point in their lives, encounter difficulties with motivating ourselves to do basic tasks, even self-care. If we find it difficult even to muster up the will to look after our own essential needs, how easy do you think it is to follow additional demands from others? Mental health problems like depression and anxiety are so widespread amongst neurodivergent people there's been debate about including them as diagnostic indicators. And it doesn't take a genius to know how they can impact on our ability to function at all, let alone do specific tasks. OCD can force someone to perform tasks using a specific, meticulous method or a predefined order which may not match your expectations and lead you to think they're missing the point or not cooperating. Common neurodivergences like dyslexia, dyscalculia and dyspraxia and numerous unseen medical problems can impact on our ability to complete a task. Then there's alexithemia, which as you know, if you follow this channel, is a characteristic around half of autists share. That delay in response that someone takes as a rejection of their demand may simply be us working out how we feel about the requests you made. And even if we're not alexithemic, what about simple processing time? It's not exactly unusual for us to take much longer than expected just to reconcile all the mixed messages encoded into verbal and non-verbal communication to even know what's being asked of us. The problem with the current debate around PDA is that it's based on a false premise. It would be ridiculous to say that a pathological need to avoid demands can't or doesn't exist. Name any behaviour or activity even those which aren't seen as in any way harmful or problematic, and there will be people who feel an innate compulsion to do it, even against their own interests. Every addict is battling with a pathological need of some variety. Every phobia is an irrational fear, and PDA is a real thing without doubt. But how common is it? Following my own conversations with people whose lives have been blighted with the PDA label, I have my doubts that it's anywhere near as common as its proponents think, and even less confidence that it's worthy of inclusion in any diagnostic procedure. I have no personal objection to research into pathological demand avoidance whatsoever, but I can't support it in its current state. Before we jump to the conclusion that someone has a compelling, pathological need to refuse cooperation, we have to eliminate all the possibilities mentioned earlier and plenty of others that I couldn't fit into a half-hour YouTube video. Are they demand avoidant? Or are they asking questions the other party doesn't want to answer, can't answer, or can't be bothered to answer? Are both parties understanding the instruction in the same way, and all objectives made clear? 
Does the request clash with specific sensory differences, moral understandings, or could it do unintentional harm? PDA is just too convenient a rug to brush genuine concerns and trauma under. It allows real problems to be ignored and absolves the perpetrators of responsibility because they no longer have to face the consequences of their actions. Their inappropriate behaviour, poor communication or intolerance ceases to be the issue with the convenient peg of pathological demand avoidance to hang their woes on. So why should they stop? To regard someone as pathologically demand avoidant without first eliminating every other possibility or cause is neither morally justifiable nor scientifically wise. When you have difficulties in communicating with them too, you risk dipping your toes into the inhuman. In years gone by, we saw talk amongst the noblest of academics of personality traits having a male or female bias, so they could promote autism as a brand of hypermasculinity, the extreme male brain, then wondering for years why so few girls and women were being diagnosed. They told us we lacked empathy, claimed by them as the essence of what it means to be human, then stood back whilst their irresponsible speculation was twisted into a template of cold, ruthless villainy to suit the needs of all who would use it to their advantage. From the crooked boss to the resentful partner, right up to the prosecutor in the criminal court. Now we have PDA, pathological demand avoidance, and the dangers are plain to see. So why isn't any attention being paid? The moment you put the idea of PDA into the hands of the wrong people, and believe me, wherever there's self-preservation or money, position, lust, personal favour, even just popularity at stake, an awful lot of people become the wrong people. When they get hold of PDA, you are opening up an already vulnerable and marginalised group to a whole new arena of abuse beyond any we've known before. When you allow our doubts, our concerns, even our nightmares to be dismissed as a symptom of a medical condition to be cured, you take away our right to say no. You rob us of our agency, and of our dignity. If we can't say no, we can't protect ourselves. In an age of increasing misogyny, how will a female autist ever feel safe when a predatory male can dismiss their protests as demand avoidance in the full knowledge that there's a bevy of autism experts willing to back them up in court? We're robbed of the ability to agree or disagree, consent or decline, trust or be trusted. The right to say no is the most fundamental of all human rights, for without no, we have nothing. PDA is a buzzword seeking a home. A neat concept looking for enough traction to finance a few lucrative research careers. And it's easy to see why it's been shoveled into the ever-deepening pit of possible symptoms of autism because it dovetails nicely with the existing tranche of inaccurate and misleading interpretations of autistic minds. If we really were the insensitive, empathy-free, big-picture-missing and emotionally dead creatures we're painted to be, it would slot in place neatly. But that's not who we are. We are thinking, feeling human beings, trying our best to fit into a world that doesn't accommodate us. Every day of our lives, we're fighting against misunderstandings, harmful assumptions and the insidious influence of prestigious yet ill-informed experts making our daily lives ever harder with their latest theory du jour. We really don't need another. Thank you for watching. This video has been on the cards for a long time and required a mountain of research and discussion with other autists to bring it together. Thanks to everyone who contributed, either directly or by creating the materials I used to learn more about this controversial topic. It's a bit longer than my usual content, but I hope you found it enjoyable and informative. Because life is still more complicated around here lately, I'm going to be making more of these longer form videos for a while. 
So if there are any topics you'd like to see me cover, please let me know in the comments. I can't promise to take on every subject, but everything gets considered. Finally, a big thank you to all the patrons who've stuck with me through what's been a very difficult stage of my life, and the many, many people who've opened their hearts and shared their experiences to make this channel possible. See you soon.